Hi everyone, it's top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, thanks for joining today's webinar, COVID-19 and the new normal workplace, how can sound masking help? I know your time's precious, so I appreciate you carving out what should be about a half hour uh, to spend with me today. I'm Nathan Van Ness, one of Biamp's product marketing managers, and I'm responsible for our building infrastructure solutions, which includes sound masking and voice communications. Um, and also joining me, waiting in the wings here, is Daryl Nishinia, a Biamp field sales engineer, and uh, he helps cover technical sales in our Western US region. So the agenda for today, uh, we're gonna get into some office acoustics fundamentals, talk about COVID-19 impacts on office acoustics. We're gonna dive into how sound masking can help. And we're gonna look a little bit at to, to, to today's BiAMP, uh, some of our product offerings. Uh, and more information following that. And then we'll get into a Q&A where we will do our best to answer any questions that might come up during the presentation. So first off, let's talk about office acoustic fundamentals. Okay, so in the world of architectural acoustics, we talk about three main concepts to discuss noise control and speech privacy. We call them the ABCs of architectural acoustics. The first is A for absorbing, and most of us are probably familiar with this concept. Absorption is simply the process of adding acoustically absorptive materials to a space, like acoustic ceiling tiles, acoustic wall panels, carpeting, etc. And then we get to B for blocking. This is the use of solid barriers to block direct sound from one person or space to another. Typical examples are cubicle partitions, walls, windows, doors, or any material that has an associated mass that can act as a barrier to sound. Pretty straightforward. And then C for covering. Common forms of covering are unintentional functions of HVAC noise, vehicular traffic, water noise, or anything that is contributing to the background noise level. One of the tools we use to control background sound is sound masking, and we'll get into more details about sound masking later. Uh, and just note here that we could also add a D for distance, which simply acknowledges that sound diminishes as it travels from its source to the surrounding listeners. So now looking at modern furniture and construction trends, it isn't much of a stretch to see how the ABCs of architectural acoustics are affected. In open office environments, there's no doubt the cubicle, uh, cubicle partition heights have come down significantly. Gone are the days of using 60 inch, 65 inch, or 70 plus inch partitions. Um, as anybody who has visited their offices or still might be working in uh, their workplaces, you know that these days, uh, 48 inch and 54 inch partitions are the norm. Plus with considerations like LEED and other green building initiatives, uh, they've had a drastic effect on these heights because of the emphasis on allowing natural light penetration into the interior of the building. When open office environment trends began years ago, it wasn't uncommon to see 10 foot by 10 foot cubicles. But today the typical size of cubicles is more often eight by six or six by six, packing people into uh, you know, to that floor space to save on rent, I guess. And then we have benching, which is a picnic table method of seating people adjacent to and across from one another with a shared work surface. This has also been popular uh, in offices, and it was gaining significant traction because it allowed many people to fit into a small space. One result of these new office environment trends is that carpeting, acoustical ceiling tiles, and absorptive cubicle walls became much less common. In more traditional enclosed offices, demountable partitions, which basically are just movable walls, are pretty common because of the ability to quickly and cost-effectively reconfigure an open office floor plan. The only problem is that demountable partitions don't extend above the ceiling deck, and for other reasons, just aren't very effective noise blockers. But even when traditional walls are used, they most often don't extend to the deck above the sub-ceiling which then puts the onus on the ceiling material to absorb sound so that it doesn't travel from one space to the next. And glass has become a favorite for many architects and interior designers because it fits well with a desire for openness, staff collaboration, and natural lighting. 
but unfortunately glass doesn't perform as well as traditional walls when it comes to blocking sound. So in both of these graphics, you see the blue C for covering, which shows how sound masking emitters might be used as a noise coverage solution. And again, we'll get into uh, what the specifics regarding sound masking are as we progress. So let's talk about COVID-19 and, and its impacts on office acoustics, or certainly what we expect to see going forward. We'll start by talking about how things were before the current pandemic. In many pre-COVID office environments, we know there were lots of employees packed into their workplace with no social distancing requirements. And before now, really, why would there be, right? Employees were free to move about, mingle, and conduct work wherever they felt most productive, which meant a high energy level. So there was plenty of constant ambient sound with human activity and the building's normal inorganic noises like, like the HVAC system. But based on what we've learned to expect going forward, the office as we previously knew it is changing. No surprise. And so here are just a few recent quotes from reputable publications that help illustrate what we're likely to experience. Quote, both the office and the popular open floor plan will still have a place in the post coronavirus future. We're certainly see seeing that uh, there's no indication that the open office trend is going to die completely. Quote, you should expect to see plexiglass and other dividers rise up, creating walls around desks. Um, anybody who goes grocery shopping or visits uh, places where you used to have face-to-face -face interaction with no barriers, obviously that's not the norm these days. Plexiglass is everywhere. Quote, the likely reality is that we will eventually return to a collective workplace, but one that has changed beyond what we could have previously imagined. Still a lot to be determined about what we'll experience once uh, we start returning to the office with regularity. And according to a recent survey conducted by McKinsey and Company, business leadership is well aware of the need to adapt their office environments to meet the requirements of the quote, new normal. Leaders know they'll need to make changes to the office, pretty straightforward. And so these are the changes that are expected in order of importance based on the survey's respondents. Eighty-four percent said physical separation of workstations will be the most important. Sixty-nine percent said insta that we'll see the installation of physical barriers between workstations. Forty-three percent expect to see handles replaced uh, and touch points uh, will be replaced with touch-free or with hands-free devices. And then forty-one percent expect uh, a change in surface materials to antiviral surfaces. So these are some of the things that we expect to see as workers begin to settle into their new normal workplace. In open office environments, we'll see staggered work schedules, which will definitely help with social distancing, or maybe because you know they're gonna be in the workplace, we should call it professional distancing. It seems like uh, social distancing has become a pretty tired phrase, but uh, anyway, that's not for me to decide. On-site staff level irregularity will likely cause noise distractions, speech privacy, and employee comfort to be more noticeable issues than they were with consistently and more heavily occupied office spaces. In the more traditional office spaces, we'll see partitions between coworkers made out of acoustically reflective surfaces like plexiglass and antimicrobial material. And because of their reflective nature, these surfaces will be pretty disruptive to your environment's overall acoustic, acoustics. As a result, noise distractions, speech privacy, and employee comfort will likely become even bigger challenges going forward. So to reiterate, with less human activity, new desk configurations, and the widespread use of modular barriers and partitions, office acoustics will probably become inconsistent, non-uniform, and less comfortable. We'll see reduced office occupancy, staggered schedules, mandatory distancing, and lots of acoustically reflective surfaces. So let's talk about sound masking and how it can help with some of the issues we just talked about. First question to ask uh, for some of you on this call, I assume, is 
what is sound masking? Um, maybe you don't even know what it is at a high level, so let's dive into it. Sound masking adds a consistent level of ambient background sound to indoor environments. It's often incorrectly compared to white noise. Uh, sound masking is uh, actually specifically engineered to match the frequencies of human speech and to be comfortable, even pleasant to the human ear. When implemented properly, sound masking should fade into the background hum of a workplace while simultaneously making surrounding voices more difficult to hear and understand. But it begs the question, what real world problems does sound masking solve? Sound masking helps achieve three key outcomes. Protects speech privacy. It reduces noise distractions and increases workplace comfort. But what's the definition of speech privacy as we use it uh, with regard to sound masking? Here's a pretty, pretty uh, simple definition. Speech privacy is the inability of an unintentional listener to understand another person's conversation. So when we look at acoustics related complaints of office workers, we find that most complaints center around the idea that others can hear our conversations or that we can hear others' conversations. Rarely is the problem that there is simply too much noise in an environment. Speech privacy complaints are due to distractions caused by overheard conversations. The perceived level of distraction relates to directly to the intelligibility of the overheard conversation, which means can we understand what's being said around us? Intelligibility depends on the loudness of overheard speech compared to the loud, loudness of the background noise. So, people have no problem working in a coffee shop or other public space uh, because of the constant ambient noise that surrounds them. But once they're in an office, the expectation of privacy is very different. And indeed, the reality of privacy is very different as well. In the office, we're able to understand every word our neighbors are speaking into their phone, but in the coffee shop, it really didn't seem to matter. So again, when we define speech privacy, there must be an element of intelligibility. It is not practical to eliminate all conversational sounds in a workplace, but it's certainly possible to significantly reduce intelligible or distracting speech. So why does speech privacy matter? Well, for starters, I'm sure everyone can relate to those times when we're at work, intensely focused on the task at hand, only to be disruptive, uh, disrupted by a nearby coworker's voice. Maybe they're on the phone arguing with their spouse or yelling at their kid, or maybe we overhear a conversation that discloses private information, like a manager discussing workplace issues and dropping the word, quote, layoffs. It's hard to refocus on your work and stay productive when these distractions occur. So speech privacy is a big deal, and a lack of it is incredibly disruptive. Um, looking at a survey that was done a while ago, uh, the Center for Build Environment in San Francisco uh, conducted uh, a questionnaire with 25,000 workers in more than 2,000 buildings to determine their key environmental issues. And the results mirrored those determined over the last 20 years in similar surveys, specifically that a lack of speech privacy was considered to be the most objectionable among several potential workplace issues. So looking at this uh, graphic on the right here, right at the top, acoustic privacy uh, was, was pretty significantly more prevalent when it comes to worker complaints uh, above even, even thermal comfort or air quality. Okay, so in the next four slides, we're gonna talk about the, the, the four primary elements of all sound masking systems. In a nutshell, to create an effective sound masking system, we need the correct sound or spectrum, the correct sound level, control over the system with proper zoning, and finally, uniformity of coverage. So let's dive a little bit deeper into each of these. When talking about sound spe spectrum, we really need the right sound. You probably have heard of sound masking being called white noise or pink noise. And that's fine for conversations with most end users up to a point. But sound masking, as you see, has a very different sound spectrum than white and pink noise. As you'll see on the graph here, sound masking noise differs from both white and pink noise. 
uh, it can be thought of as another filter in front of a light. This filter was created or engineered for the very specific pur purpose of speech privacy. It considers how we as humans interpret sound with our ears and the frequency content of our voices. So what I want you to take away from this slide is that sound masking noise is a very specific type of noise that acoustical engineers have created for the purpose of speech privacy. It's related to white noise and pink noise, but there's a clear distinction between the mathematical definition of those and sound masking. So when talking about sound masking levels, uh, what we really are the, the proper level of sound masking, what we're talking about is quote, the right level, what's ideal. So for comparison purposes, let's look at the levels of various common sounds in decibels. We have a quiet library at right around 30 decibels. Office conversation, 60 decibels, give or take. Obviously there are a lot of variables that affect that. Uh, vacuum cleaner, right around 70 decibels. Passenger aircraft at 85. A power drill, 98. And then the ideal setting for sound masking is at 48 decibels, okay? Uh, the next element in a proper sound masking system is to have the proper zoning. Zones help to meet the requirements of just diverse spaces. So sound masking systems must be flexible enough to accommodate complex architectural spaces. No surprise there. With changes in the size, volume, ceiling height, furnishings, and others, uh, other factors in play, a sound masking system must also change in order to provide a consistent sound field. And this is accomplished by incorporating zones into the design so that the system is divided into smaller pieces, each of which can be tuned for that environment. So the easiest example of this is shown on the screen. We see here the open office zone, the private office zone, and then a zone for the reception area. Each of these environments is very different from the other, um, acoustically speaking. Therefore, we need to be able to adjust the masking for each one without affecting the others. Okay, and then the last of the four key elements of a proper sound masking system is uniformity. A large part of the philosophy of sound masking is the idea that it should be as uniform as possible. And this is really critical. The more uniform a noise is, the easier it is for us to tune it out, okay? And then think about that coffee shop example, right? You're working away surrounded by people engaged in conversations, but it's relatively easy to tune that out. In every respect, sound masking should be unwavering, constant, and unchanging. Any hot spots, dead spots, or other changes to the noise only serves to increase the likelihood of the occupants noticing it. And for that reason, we often install sound masking in spaces we, where we are not necessarily concerned with speech privacy, like hallways or corridors, reception areas, lobbies, transitional areas, places like that. As you can see here, sound masking speakers are laid out on a grid pattern in such a way that they can effectively cover 100% of the area. You should be able to walk through an office with sound masking and not notice any fluctuations in sound level. It should be consistent as you enter the building and you start to hear it in the reception area and then you migrate through the open office area to a private office. Um, it should be a very consistent, i.e. uniform distribution of the sound masking, uh, sound masking signal. So specifically, uh, speaking about COVID-19, the new normal, what we might see in offices going forward, how can sound masking help? No matter the extent of all because of COVID-19, the potential for noise distractions, lack of speech privacy, and insufficient employee comfort will remain. We're all going to be human still. We're all going to be talking. So um, those things aren't going away. We just need to address them slightly differently. So sound masking will be an important solution because it directly addresses those three problems. Now that we know what sound masking is, uh, a bit more about office 
acoustic uh, considerations and uh, how sound masking might address those evolving considerations going into um, workspaces changing over time as we start to go back to the workplace. Let's talk about the specific uh, differences in sound masking technologies. We're talking about indirect versus direct field. The first we'll talk about is indirect. It's a popular method of implementing sound masking um, uh, that uses uh, indirect or upward firing loudspeakers that are typically placed below the ceiling deck in what's known as the plenum space, as shown here by those two red icons. The sound masking signal is broadcast against the ceiling deck and then, office, uh, and then often reflects downward through the ceiling tiles and into uh, the office environment below those acoustical tires, tiles. So the ma major um, advantage of indirect sound masking is the ability to individually tune the loudspeakers according to the plenum spaces variables, like HVAC ductwork or extensive cabling infrastructure or other acoustics altering factors where the ability to have individual speakers individually tuned to compensate for those variables is going to be really important to allow the uniform broadcasting of the sound masking signal. So BiAMP's indirect sound masking solution is known as DynaSound Pro. And here's a, a, a quick uh, visual of what a, a basic DynaSound Pro network topology might look like. Um, you see, uh, you, know, you see the, the, the white can looking things there. Those are the upward firing emitters. They're connected to the sound masking controllers which are networked using category cable um, to the various components that, um, that generate the sound masking signal uh, in those various plenum environments. Okay, you can see here we have different types of sound masking emitters depending on what, uh, what those plenum space variables might be. Um, again, this, this system allows independent control of each loudspeaker, unmatched flexibility, and you can also easily add paging or background music if uh, that's what's required for any uh, specific space or customer. Okay, now we're going to talk about direct field sound masking, which is uh, uh, relatively new compared to indirect. In, in the early 2000s, acoustic consultants came up with uh, this alternative, taking advantage of advances in loudspeaker and amplifier technology. Like I said, it's called direct or direct field sound masking. Simple network cabling is used to distribute sound masking to tiny loudspeakers. You can see them here, these, these really small gray colored uh, icons set in the ceiling tiles there. The loudspeakers, which are also called emitters, broadcast the sound masking signal directly into the office environment. Direct field sound masking eliminates some of the commissioning challenges of in plenum designs and it's highly energy efficient. In addition, sound masking can be more completely confined to the areas where it is required and independent spaces or zones can more precisely receive the de desired sound masking level. And BiAMP's direct field sound masking system is called the QT Pro. And this is probably well, I don't want to give a percentage, but this is definitely the industry's most uh, popular solution for uh, sound masking installations today. Okay, BiAMP has two different types of direct field emitters in our QT Pro offering. We have our QT Pro standard emitters, which are used just for sound masking. And then we have the QT Pro active emitters, which are enhanced to allow compatibility with paging and background music sources. And here's a look at a uh, very simple QT Pro um, topology here. We have the control module. Uh, the emitters are connected via daisy chain standard category cabling. Uh, the control module is rack, is rack or wall mountable. You can control up to six distinct sound masking zones covering, believe it or not, up to 72,000 square feet. 
Um, like I said, the cabling is daisy chain between the emitters. And if you choose the active emitters, you can easily add paging or background music. So here's a slide to give you an idea of some of the places where we implement sound masking. Healthcare is very common where uh, patient comfort as well as confidentiality, uh, speech privacy are critical, often required by law. Government facilities, uh, skiff rooms where uh, confidential or you know, uh, uh, private secret information is discussed. Legal environments uh, where, conf uh, um, where client confidentiality is a must. Um, education, typically higher education environments, um, often libraries, research laboratories, health centers, et cetera, various retail environments, uh, venues, event centers, such as houses of worship or conference centers, hospitality, you know, think of a corridor of hotel rooms uh, with the, the rooms closest to the elevator lobby, having to deal with that disturbance of the ongoing signal, the chiming of the elevator arriving and the door opening, et cetera. So maybe some of those rooms closest to that corridor could benefit from having sound masking. And then the finance sector, banks, um, call centers where clients' uh, private information is being openly discussed. Now let's talk a little bit, just very briefly, about today's BiAmp. We're not just a building infrastructure solutions company. Um, our motto is connecting people through extraordinary audiovisual experiences, which encompasses a lot of different solutions. One BiAmp, many product offerings. So in addition to sound masking, BiAmp spe specializes in many pro AV solutions, from conference room technologies and microphones to networked AV processors and loudspeakers. And this is just uh, oh, a, a good cross-section of the different family names under the BiAmp umbrella. So as we uh, begin to wrap up here, uh, I want to point you to uh, our website, cambridgesound.com, which is a great resource for all sorts of additional information, um, information that augments what I've discussed today. You'll see system design guides for common installations, customer case studies, uh, product specifications, everything you would want to know about our sound masking solutions can be found here. And just note that after this session's over, uh, you will be provided a PDF version of this uh, presentation, so you can use this as a resource. Yeah, if other questions come in, like I said, the website's a great resource to either find those answers on your own or to uh, you know, to, to give us a ping and uh, one of our experts will get back to you in a timely fashion. Um, thanks again, everybody, for taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, sit through this presentation. I hope you found it valuable. I hope you're uh, taking away some new knowledge and uh, good luck out there. Um, stay safe and, and stay healthy, everyone. Thanks again.